Uh, thank you very much, Achilles. Uh, I'm Roger Cohen, columnist for the New York Times. Uh, well, after the uh, barbarians of ISIS, we thought we'd take you on a brief diversion to an unemotional issue, uh, whether or not um, the Elgin marbles should be... The Parthenon marbles. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, when you have a difference, even on terminology, you have a problem. Uh, what is known as the Elgin marbles in Britain is known here, of course, as the Parthenon sculptures. And Lord Elgin, who was uh, Britain's ambassador plenipotentiary to the Ottoman Empire, which then uh, occupied this particular piece uh, of, of real estate, is variously regarded by some in Britain as a savior of these sculptures, which would otherwise have been destroyed. Uh, or as a vandal. Uh, the words of which we are speaking, and here's the relevance to our overall topic, are of course um, the highest artistic expression of Athenian democracy, of the world's first democracy. And as anyone who's visited the wonderful new Parthenon Museum knows, uh, feelings here run extremely high uh, on the issue of their return. Um, and speaking to cultural mingling to uh, talk about this today, um, you have uh, an Australian who doesn't sound like an Australian, that's Geoffrey Robertson, one of Britain's leading barristers, and myself, an American who doesn't sound like an American. So, um, Geoffrey, we've been talking about the universality of democratic ideas, even if that was contested by Mr. Lee, and we've been talking about the universality of culture. So isn't it a good thing, really, that uh, this very highest expression of the world's first democracy should not, in fact, be concentrated in one place, but should be dispersed, and that about 30% of the original frieze and associated statuary uh, should be open to the many, many visitors of the British Museum, and indeed visitors to museums in France and Germany, rather than concentrated in one place. Isn't that, in fact, a good thing? Okay, let's start. Uh, Private Eye calls me an Australian who's had a vowel transplant, so uh, bear with that. But uh, this is the British Museum's uh, defense. It calls itself a something for everyone museum. And uh, it prides itself on having the Elgin marbles, as it's called by law in Britain, in the Duveen Gallery. Duveen is a great fraudsman, a, a, a dreadful uh, crook, uh, but he donated the gallery where, in disrespect of these marvelous figures, they are uh, situated and will be situated forever if the British government has its way. And they say, look, we're a something for everyone museum. You can skip through the the Duveen Gallery, you can go and see Tutankhamun's tomb, you can then go and see the chessmen from the Isle of Lewis and the, the, what Captain Cook brought back from the Pacific. And this is a kind of cultural smorgasbord in which the half, the Parthenon that sculptures that survive, uh, become a cultural tidbit. Now, this is the British Museum's sole argument, really, uh, because it can't argue that... The museum doesn't call it a cultural tidbit. No, I call it a cultural tidbit. The museum calls it a something for everyone museum, okay? 40% of the visitors don't even go to look at the Elgin marbles. They rush down to Tutankhamun's mummies. Uh, the uh, whole point of reuniting the uh, half, the amazing frieze that was put on the Parthenon at the beginning of democracy. This is, I, for those of us who, who, who don't know what we're talking about, uh, in 448 BC, Pericles, after the wars, Marathon and Salamis were won, uh, and Athens was an empire without an emperor, it had a form of democracy, uh, for men at any event, uh, decided to spend the war chest not on war or commemorating the war, but on peace, on this amazing building and its temples 
with a frieze that would show, and, and is a snapshot of the earliest time that we can really call this world civilized. There are people, they're talking, they're conversing, they're drinking, a lot of drinking, uh, they're playing games, they are, it is a, a kind of snapshot of the beginnings of civilization. And it's in fact ripped in half by the determination of the British government and particularly the trustees of the British Museum to keep the statues and the frieze that was ripped off the wall illegally by other but, but Geoffrey, modern Greece did not exist then. Um, Athens was part of the Ottoman Empire. Money exchanged hands. Was this not simply an acquisition by one power from another power that does not exist today, the Ottoman Empire? It was, many argue, a commercial transaction and a legal one. No, it wasn't. It was totally illegal. We did a careful study of this as part of our uh, legal An unbiased study? For the, yeah, absolutely. And what we found was that the application by Elgin for a license was merely to cast, uh, do casts of the sculptures and the frieze and to dig up bits of sculpture that were on the ground after the Venice uh, explosion by the Venetian troops back in 1680. And whether that was license was given or not, we don't know. We haven't seen that license has never been produced. There was an Italian version of the license, which makes clear that it only related to taking molds and to digging up bits and pieces of sculpture on the ground. So there is no question but that Elgin had no right in law. What he did, what his men did, was to bribe the Turkish governors. We've now got a list of the dueling pistols and the telescopes, not to mention the money that they were paid. There was no legality at all about the transaction, and Elgin didn't pretend that there was. When he gave evidence in 1816 to the British Committee, he said uh, that we exceeded the terms of the firm. There was no doubt about that. The committee found that they did. Uh, his it, defense it, it, was... The Parthenon had, had been a it had been a church, uh, it had been attacked by the Venetians, it had been a mosque, it had been many things since the 5th century BC. And isn't the argument that there was a real danger that they might have been destroyed if Elgin hadn't rescued them a valid one? Elgin didn't rescue them, he misappropriated them, he ripped them off the wall without permission. They would stood for 2,300 years, uh, despite all... And, that had happened, they were there. The Venetians had tried to rip them off and couldn't. Elgin with 300 workmen. Uh, Elgin claimed in his evidence that he'd come to Athens, he'd seen, uh, he talked to the Turkish soldiers, he feared that they would be destroyed if he didn't, quote, rescue them. That was a total lie because we discovered that he didn't come to Athens until the middle of 1802, when at least half of them had been ripped off. So this was, he invented this in order to obtain money from the British government because he was bankrupt. And he was desperate by 1816 to obtain some money from the sculptures that he'd taken for his own. It, it was, the idea was to have them, uh, embroider his Scottish estate. So, uh, and he used his power as ambassador, and he used the British Navy to uh, cart them off. So he, Britain, I think, is liable for his depredation. Geoffrey, today, Greece is a democracy. It's a troubled democracy, but it's a democracy. Uh, Britain is a democracy. Um, why can't two democracies within the European Union conduct um, diplomacy between each other uh, to resolve this problem. You, I think, believe that the only way this can be resolved at this point is through legal means, and whether in uh, the European Court of Human Rights or the International Court of Justice. Um, if we can have diplomacy over the Iranian nuclear program, why can't uh, two democracies conduct 
cordial diplomacy that would resolve this issue. Because Britain has utterly refused for uh, ever since, I think, the first Greek demand was made in the 1830s uh, when the Parthenon was given to uh, trust to the Greek Ar archaeological service. From that time onwards, Greece has been requesting, politely asking, and it is quite clear that although the Foreign Office at several times have said privately, we obtained private memoranda from the Foreign Office, uh, which has said the, the marbles should be handed back, we have no right to them, uh, that uh, British government has refused. They've locked them up by legislation, an 1816 law, be passed because Elgin had no proper title to them, uh, vested them in the trustees of the British Museum, and a 1963 law prevents the trustees of the British Museum from uh, dispersing them. So that uh, the only solution to unlock them, because of this locking up by domestic British law, is international law. And uh, Britain refused, the, the final uh, gesture was in uh, May the, March the 26th of this year, when the UK adamantly refused to uh, UNESCO's request that it should engage in mediation over the future of the marbles. They're looking at the history. There is no doubt that diplomatic and political efforts over the last 200 years have almost, have come to nothing and will come to nothing. The marbles will remain in the Duveen Gallery, honoring the memory of an art forgeman forever, unless uh, the Greek government takes legal action that is available to it. Or uh, request UNESCO. I believe UNESCO has a duty and has the power uh, to bring this before the International Court of Justice and uh, I consider that the precedence is such, and the importance is such, given what ISIS is doing, the need to develop laws about cultural property and the protection of cultural property, uh, the time is now ripe. And if, <laughs> if Greece doesn't start taking that action uh, relatively soon, uh, it will face the legal argument that it's stood on its rights for too long. But does culture belong to anybody? It belongs, it's quite interesting. And if so, in what sense? Well, what the courts are saying, and, and this was said by Doesn't the, it belong to all humanity? Okay, listen. What the courts have been saying uh, since the International Court of Justice restored to Cambodia some cultural artifacts taken by And Thailand. what's next, the Rosetta Stone um, back to Egypt? Well, where do you stop? One thing at a time. What the <laughs> courts, Roger, what the courts are slowly said is that it is part of a nation's sovereignty to own what they call the keys of its natural, of its heritage, of its historical heritage. And for that reason, the International Court of Justice ordered the restoration to Cam a Cambodian temple of artifacts taken by Thailand. Then, the Italy, the highest court in Italy, ordered the return to Libya of the, the Cyrene Venus because it was part of its cultural heritage. Then courts in Ireland, in Britain, and in America have used the same terminology, that it is part of a state's sovereignty to own the keys of its natural heritage. And then there is, of course, so that is one line of argument that Greece could and should deploy. The other, but of aren't course... Aren't you being more Greek than the Greeks? If the Greek government has declined to bring a lawsuit <laughs> up to now, why, why are you um, an Australian <laughs> working in Britain uh, telling the Greeks they damn well better get on with it? It's been suggested that they should be returned to Melbourne where there are more, Gre more Greeks than there are in Athens. But uh, <laughs> then, then, then they might be a compromise. Then, then they could be called the Melbourne Marbles. But uh, what? <laughs> well, I, I think actually that it is what I call the Navarino syndrome. Because whenever I talk to Greek politicians, they're all so grateful to Britain. You know, the, the Battle of Navarino, the first humanitarian intervention 
coalition of the willing led by Britain uh, sunk the Turkish and Egyptian fleet and, and Greek independence and of course the Nazis and, uh, and then the communists. So um, Greece, yes, uh, we don't want to upset Britain. But what they don't understand is that Britain loves litigation. <laughs> Britain, <laughs> Britain is, I have to tell you, the leader of soft power, the latest statistics, you're number six. America, but soft power in the world. As Australia. Is we, <laughs> that's quite, quite high up. But uh, what we have in Britain is a belief in law, and we actually obey international judgments, unlike other countries. You think a court uh, would find in favor of yeah, Greece? I think the, if the UNESCO uh, sought an advisory opinion, as, you know, as was done on the Israeli wall and so on, uh, I think that the, there are enough precedents now for the International Court of Justice to say that this unique, let's fix it, the Parthenon, there are three great monuments, historic monuments to civilization and to progress, really. The first is the Parthenon, above all. It's unique. Then you have the Pantheon in Rome, and until a week or so ago, you had the Temple of Bell. Mira, which was AD 32 when Christ was still walking the earth, uh, that was blown up. So we now, uh, the Parthenon is the supreme example, and the, the Foreign Office memorandums will say this is not a precedent, it's not going to be a precedent for this and that uh, going back, because it is unique to the world. It is uh, bringing it back to Greece. Can I just read you just one? Uh, way of putting it by Professor Joan Connolly, who's the art uh, history uh, professor at NYU. And she says this, and I think it encapsulates the argument brilliantly. She says, apart from the Parthenon, these statues are merely relics, however finely wrought. The wholeness of the Parthenon demands our respect and warrants every effort to reunify it. Uh, consider the state of the central figures on the West pediment. pediment. Poseidon's shoulders are held in London while his pectoral and abdominal muscles remain in Athens. Athena's battered head, neck and right arm are displayed by the New Acropolis Museum while her right breast remains in the British Museum. This deliberate and sustained, yeah, this deliberate and sustained dismemberment have some of the most uh, sublime images ever carved by humankind brings shame on those who work to uphold this state of affairs. And those who work to uphold that state of affairs are the trustees of the British Museum and uh, the British government. And they will all produce that. Remember that the idea of the snapshot of the beginnings of civilization, the snapshot that they have determined should be ripped in half. Do you see what's happened, the terrible things that have happened in Palmyra and ISIS's wanton destruction of um, these great uh, works of art and expressions of ancient civilization? Do you equate that in some way with the depredations of Lord Elgin and see it as an argument for reuniting um, these statues in Greece, or do you rather see it as an argument that I suspect the British Museum would make because it's made it over uh, some objects in Syria, that there you go, you see, it's much better to um, protect wherever one can um, uh, these expressions of high civilization from elsewhere in somewhere as safe uh, as London at the British Museum, very close to well, the New York Times, Times office there. Uh, so isn't it, is it an argument for reuniting the works or is it an argument for putting them in a safe place like the Louvre or the British Museum? Well, firstly, it's an argument for the international law, what we call customary international law, to deal with the question of protecting historic monuments and uh, of unique importance to civilization. But secondly, of course, uh, the British Museum, I salute for its, its appointed some monuments men and they're going around Iraq at the moment. And, but they always say, and rightly, that as soon as the war is over and it's safe, they will go back. Uh, Greece 
is surely a safe place for its heritage. Even today. <laughs> Even today, uh, and especially today. What do you the New Acropolis Museum is not only a safe place, it's the right place. Well, and it was obviously built to house to, their ev eventual yeah. return. It's a, it's a museum in waiting, mm. uh, in a sense. What do you think would be, I mean, speaking of democracy, uh, and Greek democracy in particular, which has been battered in recent years by a terrible economic crisis and an agonizing conundrum over what to do about the euro and big questions about how far democracy still still functions here. Uh, let's just imagine for a moment that miraculously uh, a court case was won or Britain suddenly gazed no, deep into the ball and, and, and it's not going to do that, that even under Mr. Corbyn. Corbyn. If, if the Parthenon statues or Elgin mm. marbles uh, came back here to that beautiful museum, um, would that somehow reinforce Greece, Greek democracy, even perhaps the Greek economy, by giving Greeks uh, a new belief in themselves? Uh, would it lead to outbursts of unproductive nationalism? Would it have no effect whatsoever? Uh, what do you think? Well, what I think is what's coming out of uh, Chicago at the moment, this new school of economic historians who argue it's ideas, not capital that produces growth, that produces development. They go back and they say, look at every country that, that has put its finances in order and progressed, and you see what that asso is associated with is cultural confidence. That societies that promote ideas in art, literature, and music. So this is a high dose injection of well, cultural confidence. Well, who knows, but that is I think it would give Greece the cultural confidence to move forward. And I think that's something that would be, uh, is, you know, we had the bailout, we had a bailout by Brussels bureaucrats and German bankers who didn't consider what the need to give Greece the support to deal with the refugee crisis. I did the first case under the Lisbon Treaty about the right to dignity a few years ago, and it was quite obvious that Greece needed the support of the European community. I think that having uh, that, having the Parthenon marbles back where they belong, in the, new, in the museum, underneath the blue attic sky and the uh, ruins of the Parthenon, uh, they will, there will be such a boost to tourism, for a start, and to a cultural confidence that now economic historians associate with economic development. Well, I'd like to uh, briefly throw this open to you to ask any questions. Before we do that, can we have a quick informal vote? Uh, raise your hand if you think the Parthenon statues should be returned to Athens, please. Gosh, <laughs> overwhelming majority, I think. And who thinks they should remain under the gray skies of Britain? Two, two, three. <laughs> All right, questions, please. Yes, sir. And can we have a mic? Thank you. I'm James Wright, the director of the American School of Classical Studies. Um, one of the things that you got close to talking about but didn't was the issue of context. Um, as a practicing archaeologist and as a representative for all American excavations in Greece for the Ministry of Culture, and you alluded to this in your remarks about uh, Greek, the Greek Archaeological Service uh, in the late 1830s, the nation of Greece declared that the cultural heritage of Greece belonged to the sovereign state of Greece. It's one of the earliest pieces of legislation um, why is it that we hear so much about the universality of cultural property, but we don't hear enough about why its context, literally the ground out of which it has been ripped and subsequently commodified for the antiquities market, isn't more important for understanding the meaning of the objects than uh, its universal value for people to appreciate in museums? Well, the context 
is terribly important. And I think the law is coming to appreciate this. I mean, the context of uh, the Parthenon marbles, as Professor Connolly says, separately in the Something for Everyone Museum, they are merely figures. They may be very finely wrought, but they have no, the context of the Parthenon and the associated temples is the context of 2,500 years ago in the world's first democracy that opted for peace, to use its money to celebrate peace, to celebrate happiness and love and, and the Athenian procession. And it took the marble from the hill, it, Phidias and the architects conceived it as a whole. You cannot, as the British Museum claims, take bits and pieces and put them up with Captain Cook's Samoan uh, artifacts and with the chessmen from the Isle of Lewis and so forth. Uh, this is nonsense. Uh, this is absurd. And, and if you read the British description of this, where they actually uh, have incredibly irrelevant associations uh, that are used uh, to justify the Something for Everyone Museum, when actually you could bring it back to the context of 448 BC, when uh, Thucydides and Herodotus were writing the first histories of the world, when Euripides and Sophocles were writing plays, when Socrates was an apprentice stonemason chipping away and uh, at building the Parthenon. And it presents, you see it, whole. And it is that context that I think the, if this case were brought, I think there is enough law to argue that it is in the interest not only of Greek sovereignty, the sovereignty of modern day Greece, but also as well uh, of the world to be able to see this first snapshot of civilization are reunited. Are you arguing that a Vermeer is less of a Vermeer outside Delft or a Velasquez is less of Velasquez outside Madrid? No, no. I'm not. Okay, uh, Kisha. Uh, Kisha Mahobani, um, and I'm glad you used the word cultural confidence at the end of your remarks. Because to me, when I'm asked to explain why Asia is doing well, I say it's because there's an, been an explosion of cultural confidence in Asia. So my question to you is where do you see cultural confidence rising and where do you see it diminishing? Well, obviously, cultural confidence has, uh, well, it was part of Lee Kuan Yew's plan for Singapore, uh, which uh, he, he achieved up to a point. Uh, I think that it is uh, cultural confidence, actually. I see it uh, rising in a strange way in America at the moment. Uh, with, I Donald see it with Donald Trump, exactly. Uh, I, see it, I see it rising in a way in Britain with Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, the, the idealists who voted for uh, a sort of unreconstructed 60s uh, Trotskyite uh, were actually saw in him a measure of principle, a measure of idealism, and in fact, uh, a measure of British history that they wanted to, Cromwell, exactly, uh, whom he venerates, uh, was, uh, so I do see that in some uh, countries among voters, among uh, large groups of people, there is a desire to get back uh, to a confident cultural position of, of their nation. There's a question at the back, and I think after that one more and we have to stop. Yes, sir. After at the back in a white shirt. Um, right, uh, please stand up, sir, so they can bring you the mic. Uh, Jeffrey and Roger, great talk, uh, very lively. It's been a little uh, more gloomy earlier in the day. But uh, uh, Jeffrey, I think on the 20th, I think I know what the Greeks need to do. They need to vote for you, Jeffrey, with an exclamation mark. <laughs> So, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, one of the questions is, I know recently the British Museum loaned, uh, uh, I don't know if it was part of the uh, freezes or so on, I think it was a statue uh, that was taken uh, by Lord Elgin to uh, the Hermitage Museum. 
And why was that done, and was that really an insult to the Greeks? <laughs> this was part of the utterly arrogant and unrealistic uh, idea that you can have cultural diplomacy. Uh, the British Museum's first experiment in cultural diplomacy came in 2011 when they lent the Cyrus Cylinder, said to be the world's first human rights treaty, uh, to Iran, okay? Uh, it arrived in Iran, and Ahmadinejad arranged for an enormous pageant to, uh, and who should play Cyrus, the center of this pageant, but an actor in the uniform of the Basij militia that had killed Abu bin Sultan and, and uh, a lot of other people. Uh, so that was a bit of a down for the first attempt at cultural diplomacy. Uh, so then Neil McGregor uh, decides, in great secret, but in, in cooperation with the Times, uh, to send the river god, Elysius, to Putin. Whose pectoral muscles have been compared to Putin. Yes, right? absolutely, are very similar. And uh, of course, this was at a time when there were sanctions against Putin for his uh, attacks on the Ukraine, when in, in St. Petersburg, he had just closed down the British Council that he's waging a war against NGOs. And so he was delighted at this cultural diplomacy. He didn't withdraw his troops from Ukraine or allow the British Council to reopen. But I think this is part of the, uh, an element of irresponsibility in the British Museum's use of its treasures. Uh, it wasn't designed to insult Greece. No, it wasn't. But we, uh, we made a Freedom of Information Act request. And I will tell you that the amount for which the river god was insured uh, would pay back Greeks, Greece's debts. <laughs> Last question. Uh, here, please, thank you. Well, yes, I would agree with you that diplomatic or political efforts will not bring the marbles back. You mentioned about legal action. I would like question one. Where do you think this legal action could be filed? Do you believe that the Hague International Court would have jurisdiction to proceed. And a second question, if, if you have a negative to that. Have you ever explored the possibility of forming an arbitration court for the auspices of UNESCO? Would Britain, Britain, Britain and Greece agree to submit the whole issue under the, under the jurisdiction of an arbitration court? Okay, uh, we have uh, I've, uh, uh, very clear that the International Court of Justice, which has 17 or 18 international judges, has jurisdiction to hear a claim made under customary international law by UNESCO. UNESCO has the power, the right, to ask for an advisory opinion. And although it's called advisory, uh, Britain, as I say, because Britain does uh, obey international courts uh, would comply with it. And because most of the British public, actually, whenever they're asked, want the Elgin marbles, as they're called, sent back, uh, it would probably be relieved to do so. There is no prospect, uh, read the letter of March 26th from the British government, that it will ever agree to negotiation, to mediation, to arbitration. That's out the window. So uh, the, the alternative, and there is uh, another solution which would be mean a interstate action, Greece versus the United Kingdom, in the European Court of Human Rights under Article, in Strasbourg, under Article 1 uh, of the, pro the Protocol 1, uh, the right to property, the right to have uh, sovereignty. This would pick up the sovereignty argument that uh, this unique historical heritage uh, belongs to Greece. So, uh, but that has all been delivered. I, if you'll allow me to say, Roger, that um, uh, we uh, were asked by the Greek government to give our opinion. There were a lot of our articles since changed. Well, it, yes, absolutely. But there were a lot of articles in May 
uh, including, unfortunately, the New York Times, uh, which said that the Surely Greek government, not. yeah, the Greek government had rejected um, Amal Clooney's opinion. Uh, she was one of the team. And uh, this was curious, I, because we hadn't finished our opinion. We hadn't delivered it to the Greek government in May. So this was hallucinatory journalism. Uh, and By the I, New York Times. Yes, amongst others. But the fact is, we delivered our opinion in July, uh, a month or so ago. Uh, the Ministry of Culture thanked us very much and said it would be uh, sent to be considered by the next government, or perhaps the government after that, or the government after that. So that's where the, uh, <laughs> the matter lies at the moment. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey, for that spirited... <laughs> spirited exposition on the now renamed Melbourne Marbles. Um, it was great talking to you. Thank you all. Many thanks to my fellow Australian, Geoffrey Robertson, and uh, Roger, thank you for calling a SNAP referendum even speedier than uh, Alexis Tsipras, I must say. <laughs>